into loads. So thrust load capacity is the amount of force a retaining ring will accommodate once installed in a groove. Um, to go further into depth on that, there's two types of loads, static and dynamic. Static is constant. Um, the load does not increase quickly. Picture putting your hand on your desk and slowly leaning onto the desk. That's a static load. Um, dynamic loads fluctuate quickly. Um, version of that would be punching your desk. And you know, the way your hand feels after that, you'll see a big difference between static and dynamic and understand why dynamic loads for retaining rings are greatly reduced from the static. So in our catalog, we list three different loads. We list PR, PG, and P'R. PR is the thrust load for the ring. And this is the thrust load that causes the ring to fail. Uh, this is a product of the housing and shaft diameter, the part thickness, shear strength of the material. These are then multiplied by a correction factor dependent on the ring type and divided by a safety factor. The correction factors were determined by actual testing, so um, an SH ring versus an E ring or an SH ring versus uh, another type of ring will have different correction factors in the calculation. The values listed in the catalog have those correction factors taken into account. Next we have PG, the thrust load for the groove. And the calculation is similar, but the groove depth is used instead of the thickness, and the strength of the groove material is used instead of the ring material. Um, you'll see that there's a safety factor of two on the groove and a safety factor of four on the ring. It's because the loading for the ring is slightly less precise. Um, the groove staying where it is, but an example of um, a little bit of fluctuation in the ring loading is if your retained part is loading unevenly on the ring. You may get a, you know, an earlier failure than if you had a precise 360 degree contact. So a little bit of variation, we up the safety factor and hopefully you never have any troubles. Finally, we have uh, finally, we have the max load with a maximum radius or maximum chamfer. There's a decreased load um, in this scenario due to the moment from contact of the retained part. Uh, we'll touch on this a little bit more in a few slides. So since PR and PG are a function of the material strength of the ring or groove, these values are affected by material type. The catalog data listed is for carbon steel and for stainless steel. Scaling factors are used for other materials such as beryllium copper and phosphor bronze uh, due to their lower PSI of material. Easiest way to do this without running through formulas is to multiply the catalog listed values by 0.75 for beryllium copper and phosphor bronze. Um, the back of our catalog lists some correction factors for other materials as well. Likewise, the PG value is affected by the shaft or housing material. Catalog values assume cold rolled steel with a tensile yield strength of 45,000 PSI for harder or softer materials. Scale by dividing by 45,000 PSI. So if you have a shaft material that's 90,000 PSI, 90,000 over 45,000 equals two. You can double the listed uh, thrust value for the groove that we have in our catalog. And again, there's some scaling factors in the catalog for that. So this is a better view of the, of the radius and chamfer max that I was mentioning earlier. On the left, you'll see a square corner on the retained part that puts the loading of the ring even with the top of the groove. Uh, next to that, you'll see a corner radius where the load on the ring is higher than the, um, the groove wall, and same for the chamfer. Um, correction factors for this, 
are basically take your p prime r, your uh, the radius, the sorry, the value listed in the catalog, and scale it by the actual radius used. Now, if you're paying close attention, you'll notice that this will approach infinity as the radius or the chamfer approaches zero. So basically the value should either be the calculated value or the value listed for PR and PG in the catalog. Um, if, your, if your value, sorry, if your radius goes pretty close to zero, you can treat your, um, you can treat your retained part as square corner. If you do have a large radius on your retained part, you can also include a, um, a washer in between your retained part and the retaining ring, and you can then treat that as a square corner retained part. Another thing to consider is edge margin. Um, to ensure that PG listed in the catalog is appropriate, the shafter housing must have enough material to back up the groove wall. When Y, the edge margin, um, is three times, no, let's start this again. The distance between the groove wall and the edge of the shaft is the edge margin, um, known as Y as the variable for that. Um, D being the groove depth, if the edge margin is three times the groove depth, the groove can withstand the maximum thrust listed in the catalog. If Y over D is less than three, a scaling factor should be used. Um, this isn't a linear scaling factor. It's actually based on a graph in the back of our catalog. Um, so that's where to refer in that case. Loads are also affected, or another thing to consider when planning for your load is the wall thickness of a hollow shaft or a housing. Um, just like edge margin, you don't want to be too thin here or you could easily destroy your shaft or housing. On the right side of the screen, we show a sharp versus crown side on a retaining ring. The stamping process creates a, a radius and then a sharp from where the material is moved in the stamping process. Um, there is a very slight difference in the thrust capacity, but our general advice here is if your design requires ensuring that the sharp side is always loaded, you should probably reevaluate your design as you are nearing the thrust load limits as the ring of the ring. Um, so if you're asking your assembly line to make sure the ring gets installed in the correct um, orientation, best to go back to the drawing board. Dynamic loads, so punching the table. Um, there's two types of dynamic loads sudden loads and impact loads. Sudden loads occur when a surge and thrust load is transmitted to a ring installed tightly in an assembly. So in this scenario, there is no play between the ring and the retained part. The sudden load should not exceed 50% of the allowable static load, PR or PG, whichever is lower, or whichever is the factor. Um, Impact loading occurs when there is play between the retained part and the retaining ring. Um, a safe impact load can be calculated using PR or PG. For PR, the impact load will, that can be withstand is PR times the thickness of the ring divided by two, which provides some additional safety. Likewise, for PG, multiply it by the groove depth, and again, divide by two. If you need reinforcements, we have those for you. So on the right, sorry, on the left, you see our SH style ring, and next to that, our SHR style ring. Uh, SHR style is thicker and has beefier dimensions. Um, 
these parts, for example, for the inch and three quarters version, SH-175, the ring limit will be 12,992, and the SHR-175 will withstand 29,435, so more than double. And in this scenario, you actually double the groove strength as well, um, 6,200 for the SH and 12,400 for the SHR. Through actual testing, we've found correction factors for these numbers as well that can be used for calculating your own values. Um, there's no correction needed for the SH-175, so the multiplier is 1. Correction factor for the SHR is 2 for the groove, which explains why the PG value is doubled for the SHR ring. Likewise, on the right, we have our E-ring followed by our RE-ring. Um, the E-ring is a radially installed ring. The RE-ring is the reinforced version. The RE-ring is actually the same thickness as the E-ring, um, but the again, the beefier um, sections provide higher RPM limits and also higher thrust loads. So one interesting solution we solved for a customer is what do you do when the reinforced ring still isn't strong enough? A customer was using a DSR-24, that's a DIN-471 standard heavy ring, um, and they needed a little more thrust load resistance. So we looked at a DCR, which is a replacement in the spiral um, family. The DCR24 has two turns. We checked the numbers on a third turn, and we were the same as the DSR. So due to the uh, manufacturing of this part, we were easily able to add a fourth turn and increase the thrust load to where the customer needed it. And since the tooling and um, since the tooling and design work for this part were essentially non-existent, the, the price for this part was very similar to the standard part. Um, no tooling cost, no laser cutting cost, which is something we could have done. We could have taken a DSR, made it even thicker with laser production, but it's a more expensive part. Um, also, the Sections as you make the ring thicker, again, play into the spring force, and the ring may have taken permanent set beyond what is ideal for uh, during installation. 